on World News Tonight. Victory in Mariupol. Tonight, Vladimir Putin declares victory in the critical Ukrainian port city. No evidence yet as to whether the city has been completely fallen. Continued help. Western nations are getting together in aiding Ukraine with military assistance as Russia moves ahead with their offense. Party gate scandal. UK PM Boris Johnson is to become the first Prime Minister in history to be investigated for claims in deliberately misleading Parliament. And mesmerizing fields. Thousands of sightseers flock to the annual Carlsberg Flower Fields to see millions of flowers in full bloom. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden has pledged more military support for Ukraine, worth 800 million U.S. dollars, stressing that his country would continue to help defend Ukrainians from Russian aggression. Other Western countries, namely Germany, Spain and Denmark, have also vowed more military aid to Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden pledged an additional $800 million in more weaponry for Ukraine on Thursday as it faces a fresh onslaught by Russia on its eastern flank. This package includes heavy artillery weapons, dozens of howitzers, and 144,000 rounds of ammunition to go with those howitzers. It also includes more tactical drones. Those drones, or so-called ghost drones, were rapidly developed by the U.S. Air Force for Kyiv and have similar capabilities as armed switchblade drones, the Pentagon said on Thursday. Biden says the U.S. and allies are moving as fast as possible to provide Ukraine with the equipment and weapons it needs as it battles a major offensive from Russia in the east, where the flatter terrain requires a different set of weaponry. Biden also announced $500 million in direct economic assistance to the Ukrainian government. This is money the government can help use to stabilize their economy, to support communities that have been devastated by the Russian onslaught, and pay the brave workers that continue to provide essential services to the people of Ukraine. President Biden said the new assistance, which comes on top of an $800 million package announced last week, will expend most of the remaining funds available for this purpose that he will make a supplemental funding request to Congress next week. The president also announced plans to ban Russian-affiliated ships from docking at U.S. ports. None. None. Further ratcheting up pressure on Moscow. In Mariupol, around a thousand people are estimated to be trapped inside a steel plant. Ukraine's lead negotiator proposed a special round of talks to free them. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin ordered Russian forces to continue blocking that area. Around 1,000 people remain trapped in a steel plant in Mariupol. Russian attacks are closing in on this besieged Ukrainian city. An army commander from inside issued a video plea to say that the people trapped may have only a few days left. This is our appeal to the world. This could be the last appeal of our lives. We're probably facing our last days, if not hours. He added that there are about 500 wounded and hundreds of civilians, including women and children. Russia earlier this week had issued a surrender or die demand in the city of Mariupol, wanting fighters to lay down their arms by 2 p.m. Moscow time or 8 p.m. Korea time. If not, Russian forces were ready to storm in. But Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday had a change of plan. He ordered instead for Russian forces to block off the industrial area, where a thousand are trapped. Putin demanded the blockade to be airtight. There is no need to climb into these catacombs and crawl underground through these industrial facilities. Back off this industrial area so that even a fly cannot pass through. Meanwhile, Ukraine's lead negotiator Mikhailo Podolyak is reaching out to hold special talks with Moscow. He tweeted on Wednesday that Ukraine is ready for negotiations with no conditions. He said that he's hoping to save, quote, our guys. The two Koreas exchanged personal letters earlier this week. In their brief back-to-back -back forth, both hoped for improvements in inter-Korean ties. This positive development comes despite an uptick in tensions on the Korean Peninsula. It also comes just a few weeks before President Moon Jae-in leaves office. 
In a rare bout of friendly exchange, North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un reportedly traded letters this past week with South Korea's outgoing president, Moon Jae-in. The letters, reported by North Korean state media KCNA and confirmed by Moon's office, come despite strained border ties and flaring tensions over Pyongyang's recent weapons tests. KCNA said Moon sent a letter to Kim on Wednesday, in which he promised to continue pushing for unification, based on joint declarations reached at the inter-Korean summits of 2018, despite calling the situation difficult. Kim reportedly replied on Thursday that their summits were historic and gave people hope for the future. And on Friday, KCNA said Kim thanked Moon for trying to improve relations between the two countries, calling the letter exchange an expression of deep trust. Moon is set to step down in May. He urged Kim on Friday to commit to talks under his replacement, President-elect Yoon suk yeol South Korean presidential Blue House spokesperson Park Kyung-mi President Moon said the progress of dialogue is now up to the incoming government, and he hopes Chairman Kim will keep following a great cause of peace in the Korean peninsula and commit to inter-Korean cooperation. Moon staked his legacy on improving inter-Korean ties and helped arrange unprecedented meetings between Kim and then-US President Donald Trump in a bid to denuclearize the Korean peninsula. However, those talks ultimately failed, and relations between the two Koreas deteriorated, with Pyongyang criticizing what it called Seoul's double standards over its weapons development. Tensions sharply escalated last month after North Korea launched intercontinental ballistic missiles, breaking a self-imposed 2017 moratorium, with concerns that it may also restart its nuclear tests. South Korean and U.S. troops also began their annual joint military drills this week, which North Korea routinely denounces as rehearsals for war. A series of explosions across Afghanistan killed at least 16 people and wounded scores more, according to police and health officials. The Islamic State group's local affiliated claimed an attack on the Shiite mosque in a northern city, which killed at least 11 people. Broken glass and blood on the streets. Scores of people have been killed in a series of explosions across Afghanistan on Thursday. The first blasting through a Shia mosque in the northern city of mazar -e sharif killing and injuring worshippers during midday prayer for the holy month of Ramadan. The incident inside the Said Dukan mosque was really heartbreaking. I was at the market and came as fast as I could, but unfortunately, the toll of casualties and injuries are more than we could have expected. The attack was claimed by the Islamic State group, who also took responsibility for a second hit, a vehicle explosion near a police station in Kunduz, causing several more casualties. Since the Taliban seized control of the country last year, jihadist and Sunni IS groups have often targeted Shiite Hazara minorities, who've long suffered persecution in Afghanistan. We urge the Islamic Emirates to pay more attention to the security of the people. How long will such incidents continue? Afghanistan's situation is so bad, we have no secure place to live. The bloodshed comes days after at least six people were killed and dozens wounded when twin blasts, within minutes of each other, struck a boys' school in one of Kabul's Shiite neighborhoods, though no group has yet claimed responsibility. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. British lawmakers triggered an investigation into allegations that Prime Minister Boris Johnson misled Parliament in his initial responses to reports that he and his staff broke COVID-19 lockdown rules. Ayes. The motion passed without any opposition. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. British MPs agreed Thursday to trigger a parliamentary probe into Prime Minister Boris Johnson over whether he lied about the Partygate scandal, making him the first Prime Minister to be investigated for claims of deliberately misleading Parliament. It follows a day-long debate where some of Johnson's own MPs called for him to quit. Drawing a line under it. I have to acknowledge that if the Prime Minister occupied any other office of senior responsibility, if he was a Secretary of State, if he was a Minister of State, a Parliamentary Undersecretary, a Permanent Secretary, a Director General, he would be long gone. 
Johnson has been battling political survival for months after repeatedly denying the existence of Downing Street parties during lockdown, despite paying a fine last week for doing just that. Today's humiliating climb down showed that the Conservatives know they can no longer defend the indefensible. It has never been more clear that Boris Johnson's authority is shot and he is unable to lead. Britain deserves better. The PM is currently on a visit to India where he insisted he would not resign. Parliament's Privileges Committee will not begin its investigation until the current Met Police probe comes to a close and the report published in full. A UK survey this week found only 16% of the public spoke positively about Johnson, with the word liar being the most common answer. In a report from the American Lung Association, more than 40% of the Americans are living in areas with health-threatening air quality due to the number of factors, including more frequent wildfires. However, the report also had some good news sharing that the air quality in states like Ohio, New Jersey and New York is improving. Wildfires in America, bigger, more frequent and now threatening our very health, making the air we breathe more dangerous, spelled out in today's report from the American Lung Association. It finds 137 million Americans, more than 40 percent, live in places with unhealthy levels of soot and smog. We're seeing too much pollution from cars, trucks, power plants and factories, as well as wildfires that are adversely affecting our health. Four out of the top five cities with unhealthy spikes in soot pollution are in California, where wildfires burned a record number of acres in 2020. Fires can release a toxic chemical soup linked to increases in asthma, heart attacks, stroke, and lung cancer. You wouldn't want to breathe in the incinerated products of a computer or a battery. And so when you, when you look at it that way, it's not surprising that breathing in those kinds of particulates is really bad for your health. Particularly at risk, people of color, who are 3.6 times more likely than white people to live in a county with unhealthy air. Climate change is playing a role. Climate change is driving the conditions that create wildfires in the West, as well as the hot temperatures that lead to more smog in our cities. The Biden administration says that it had to appeal the judge's ruling to stop the federal mask mandate to, so that the CDC can manage not just this health emergency, but the one next as well. We're going to begin boarding in about nine minutes. For two years, airports and airlines have been on the front lines of the mask debate. Now, top airline CEOs say their customers and employees are ready to move on. We've got to do something that makes sense. And right now, we can't have our team members be in forces. We need to get them back to, to servicing. I think it's very unlikely that a mask requirement uh, is going to come back uh, anytime in the foreseeable future. But with new COVID variants still spreading, many passengers aren't ready. National poll finds 56% favor keeping the transportation mask mandate, while 24% oppose it. Adding to the mask confusion, the Justice Department's decision to appeal that federal judge's order that struck down the mask mandate. We'll respect the ruling, but we're still going to follow the science, and that's why we're appealing. But it's a gamble. Many public health experts worry the CDC could be handcuffed if the appeals court agrees it exceeded its authority. When the next big crisis hits, we want a CDC that's strong, nimble and decisive. And that won't happen if the court curtails it. Confusion and concern from planes to trains to the White House. Less than a month after its launch, Warner Brothers Discovery CNN Plus is to shut down streaming services after the platform got off to a slow start. CNN's ambitious new streaming service, CNN Plus, which launched less than a month ago, is already history. New parent company Warner Brothers Discovery announced Thursday it's pulling the plug after the platform got off to a slow start, reportedly attracting just 10,000 viewers a day. CNN Plus, which boasted familiar faces such as Anderson Cooper and Chris Wallace, debuted ahead of parent company Warner Media's merger with Discovery and reportedly cost over $120 million to launch. Its abrupt end is another reality check on the crowded and costly field of streaming businesses. Just this week, Netflix said it lost subscribers for the first time in a decade despite spending billions on programming, causing a stampede out of the stock. Among the investors making their exit, billionaire hedge fund manager Bill Ackman, 
who liquidated his fund's $1.1 billion bet on Netflix made just three months ago, locking in a loss of more than $400 million. A saturated market, along with the high cost of content, has left some investors wondering whether streaming services, once viewed as a sure bet on Wall Street, still merit their high-growth stock valuations. Sell-offs in shares of Netflix and other streaming-related stocks such as Walt Disney, Paramount Global, Warner Brothers Discovery and Roku all deepened on Thursday. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The WHO strongly recommends that patients at high risk from COVID-19 take Paxlovid, the oral treatment made by Pfizer, but also cautioned that it shouldn't be taken to people who aren't at high risk of, of hospitalization or developing severe symptoms from COVID-19. The European Central Bank has hinted that it will phase out its stimulus program in July and could raise interest rates in the same month. The United Nations Cultural Agency has postponed its World Heritage Committee, said to be hosted by Russia in June, in a move that prompted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia's hosting of the meeting was all more controversial as the invasion has resulted in damage to almost 100 cultural sites in Ukraine. Pakistan's also Prime Minister Imran Khan demanded fresh elections amid political turmoil after a new government took over and warned it faces an enormous challenge to revive a battered economy. Clashes erupted between Israeli police and Palestinians in Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque compound on the third Friday of Ramadan. Around 31 people were injured with two in serious condition. In Florida, that bill aimed at ending Disney's self-government and tax breaks got final legislative approval and seen as a victory for Governor Ron DeSantis, who is feuding with Disney over its opposition to the parental rights and education law. Florida legislators on Thursday passed a bill to revoke Walt Disney's special tax status in a move widely seen as retaliation for the company's opposition to a new state law limiting discussion of LGBTQ issues in schools. The Republican-led state house voted 70 to 38 to do away with a special tax district. The bill already passed the Senate. It now heads to the desk of Governor Ron DeSantis, who is all but guaranteed to sign it. The special tax status allowed Disney to self-govern the roughly 25,000-acre Orlando area where its Disney World theme park complex is located. It made Disney, one of the state's largest private employers, and other landowners responsible for providing services such as firefighting, power, water, and roads. In turn, Disney got some tax relief. The change would go into effect in June 2023. DeSantis, a Republican who is a potential candidate for his party's 2024 presidential nomination, moved to strip Disney of its special status after the company opposed a new Florida law that bans classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity for younger students. The governor signed the legislation dubbed the Don't Say Gay Bill by opponents last month. The law, which is to go into effect on July 1st, also prohibits such teaching that is not age-appropriate or developmentally appropriate for older students, is being challenged in court. Disney declined to comment. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of thousands of visitors flocking to one of South Southern California's most colorful and impressive annual sites. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.